Christmas is just eight short weeks away. And when it comes to fitness, this is the time of year that a lot of people just give up and say, I'll start again in January. Christmas might not be for eight weeks, but excusemus is in full flow. But if you're the type of person who's clicked on this video, well, that tells me that you're not ready to write off the next eight weeks and just give up. So today I want to give you an early Christmas present. My step-by-step -step Santa shred plan that you can use to lose 10 pounds before Christmas. But if you're skeptical about whether this would work for you or why you should even listen to me, let me introduce myself quickly. My name's Doug and I've been a personal trainer and nutritionist for over five years now. And in that time, I've helped hundreds of guys to get into the best shape of their life, all without them having to give up their favorite foods, spend their life in the gym, or lock themselves away from their friends and family. Okay, step number one is that we need to do the maths. If you wanna lose 10 pounds in the next eight weeks, that means you're gonna need to lose 1.25 pounds in each of those weeks. There's 3,500 calories in one pound of fat. And by the way, this, is what one pound of fat actually looks like. As you can tell, pretty substantial, about the size of my head. That means you're gonna need to create a 4,375 calorie deficit each week to lose 1.25 pounds per week. I wanna make this expressly clear. You don't need to do vegan. You don't need to do carnivore, keto, intermittent fasting, or any other nonsense like that. In fact, you don't need a diet at all. All you need is that calorie deficit. And a calorie deficit, very simply put, is where you are eating fewer calories than you are burning, which forces your body to burn the stored fat as energy, as fuel. And like I say, it's the only thing that you actually need to burn that fat. You don't need a special diet, you don't need a list of foods to cut out, and you certainly don't need to do hours of pointless cardio. You just need that basic maths to create that 4,375 calorie deficit. So that's step one, we have to get the maths right. But now let's talk about step two. So step one is creating that calorie deficit. Step two is how you manage it. Because at this stage, what most people would do is take that 4,375 weekly calorie deficit that we need to hit and divide it by seven because there's seven days in a week and then try and hit that same calorie deficit, which in this case would be 625 every single day. But here's the thing, if you try and hit the same calorie deficit every single day of the week, you're setting yourself up to fail because life doesn't always go our way. In fact, perfect days are a dime a dozen. Whether it's traffic jams, annoying bosses, kids, sickness, hangovers, train delays, you name it, a lot can go wrong. And let's face it, some days are just gonna be harder than others. There will come a day where you just can't be bothered to track your calories. And there will also come a day where you just really want that extra large pizza, but that's okay. Because at the end of the day, you are a human and not a robot. So instead of stressing about trying to hit the perfect calorie deficit every single day, whether it's a, a Monday, a Thursday, or a Sunday, zoom out and think bigger. Rather than looking at it as a 625 daily calorie deficit, we're gonna look at it as a 4,375 weekly calorie deficit. Now you can have low calorie days, but equally you can also have high calorie days. That way, if you go over on one day, it's not a disaster. In fact, far from it, because as long as you balance it out over the rest of the week and hit that 4,375 calorie deficit, you'll still lose the 1.25 pounds per week. This approach gives you flexibility. It's realistic and probably most importantly, it's actually sustainable. But you don't just want to be eating 4,375 calories less every single week. Let me explain. That's exactly what most fitness influencers will tell you to do, but there's a much easier way. It takes about eight minutes to walk a thousand steps, which means you can do 8,000 in just over an hour. And if you do that, you'll burn an extra 250 calories every day. 250 calories per day multiplied by seven for the seven days in a week is 1,750 calories. So if you're burning an extra 1,750 calories every single week just from walking for an hour a day, which let's be honest, we can all do, now you only need to eat 2,625 calories less each week. Now listen, that might still sound like a lot to you, and I get it, but I don't wanna overwhelm you. If you were to break that down into a daily number, it would be 375 calories less per day, which honestly is pretty easy to do as long as you're tracking your calories, because most people, when they start tracking their calories, particularly if they 
never done it before, will find one to three things that they didn't realize had as many calories in it as it does. So if you can moderate or even remove those few things just for a few weeks, you will easily be able to cut out 375 calories. That, I mean, look at it this way. The average snack or fizzy drink is about 250 calories. So if you just cut out one of those per day, you've nearly done it. And what's so crucial about this approach is that it brings it back to what we talked about earlier with the sustainability. Because doing it this way means that you don't need a diet to lose weight. You're essentially splitting the difference of your deficit. You're eating a little bit less, but you're also moving a little bit more. But it gets better because walking doesn't just help with weight loss. In fact, I think my favorite thing about walking is the powerful and positive effects that it has on your mind. And that's because walking activates something called your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system linked with rest, relaxation, and recovery. I mean, think about it. Have you ever felt less stressed or even more creative when you've got outside and gone for a walk? Well, that is your parasympathetic nervous system kicking in. When you change your environment, get outside, get some fresh air and maybe even some sunlight, you can't see what it's doing for you on the outside, but it is doing wonders for you on the inside. Use it as an opportunity to listen to an audiobook or a podcast, phone a friend, phone your mum, or switch all of your Zoom meetings to walking meetings. Because listen, it's been like four years and I can guarantee you that everybody you're doing Zoom meetings with is pretty sick of Zoom by now. And here's the thing, not all of your walking has to be purposeful because you'll do about 2,000 steps a day just existing. Whether it's commuting to work, walking around the house, playing with your kids, grocery shopping. So really, all you need to consciously think about is walking for about 45 minutes a day. That could be a 45 minute walk at the start of the day with a coffee to wake you up and get you ready to go. Or it could be 45 minutes at the end of the day to unwind and de-stress. Now that's all well and good, but to actually create your calorie deficit, you need to know something called your maintenance calorie number. If you click the first link in the description that's gonna be right underneath this video, you're gonna be taken to my completely free calorie calculator so that you can calculate your maintenance calorie number and your calorie deficit. Like I say, it's completely free. It's gonna take you 30 seconds and it's gonna make sure that you know exactly how much you should be eating so that you can reach this goal and lose the 10 pounds in the next eight weeks. Okay, so we've covered step one, which was doing the maths. Step two was that trick about zooming out. Step three was the idea that we were gonna split the difference, moving more and eating less. Now let's talk about step four. Step four is all about making this process as easy as possible. So with that, we need to talk about your protein, your fiber, your water, and your sleep. You've probably heard that protein helps you to build muscle, but it's also a fat-burning powerhouse for two reasons. Number one is that protein naturally dulls your cravings for sweet treats that are loaded with calories. And number two is that protein fills you up and suppresses your appetite, meaning you can go for longer without feeling hungrier. And it does that because protein is harder for your body to break down and digest than it is for carbs and fat. And because of that, the protein fills your stomach. And when it fills your stomach, it stretches the walls of your stomach. And when that happens, a signal is sent to your brain that you are full. Water has a very similar effect to protein. It has zero calories in it, but it fills your stomach. And again, stretches the walls, sends that signal to your brain, telling you that you are full. But the other amazing benefit of water is that it acts a little bit like your body's secondary energy system. Let me explain what I mean. Think of the calories that you eat as the fuel that you put in your car. But think of the water as the oil that you need to make sure the car doesn't break down. Every single cell in your body requires water to function correctly. That's how important it is. And dehydration can cause massive problems. It affects your energy level, your mental clarity, and even your ability to stick to that deficit. But what most people don't realize is just how sensitive our brains are to dehydration. You only need to be one to 2% dehydrated for your brain to go, okay, I'm gonna start switching some processes off, some non-essential stuff, just so I can make sure that you stay alive. And what that looks like in real life is that you start to feel lethargic. And we all know what it's like when we start to feel lethargic. 
we get lazier. Suddenly the idea of sitting on a sofa in your pants watching Netflix is pretty damn appealing, right? You get less done and when you get less done, you burn less calories. And when you burn less calories, it's obviously gonna be a heck of a lot harder for you to stay in that calorie deficit and lose the 10 pounds before Christmas. So your next question might be, how much water should I be drinking then? Well, the answer that I give to most people is more, which might sound a little bit facetious, but the reality is 80% of people just aren't drinking enough. So I'm far less worried about you drinking too much water than I am worried about you drinking too little. There's two reasons that most people struggle to drink enough water. Reason number one is that they're just not focused on it. Reason number two is that they don't understand why it's so important. They have heard a million times that they should drink more water, but they don't know why. Well, hopefully I have just told you why, and now hopefully you are going to focus more on it. And as a result, we've essentially solved that problem. But if you are still struggling to drink enough water, the simplest solution is to make sure that you keep a bottle of water, whatever that may be, in front of you, in your eye line at all times. If you think it's going to be easier for you to be more adherent with your water intake, if you were to spend some money on a fancy water bottle, then go ahead and do that. But it isn't a prerequisite. So that's protein and that's water. Now let's talk about fiber. Fiber is like a secret weapon that doesn't get the attention it deserves. It keeps you feeling fuller, it helps control your cravings, and it supports digestion. And it does all of that without adding any extra calories. Eating enough fiber makes sticking to your deficit easy. Because it's like giving your body an inbuilt appetite control system. And there's three very easy ways to get more fiber into your diet. First up is to start with a high fiber breakfast. So you can do this by adding oats, chia seeds, or even berries to your first meal of the day. These are all packed with fiber, but they're also going to keep you feeling full and energized all through the morning. Second up is to add veggies to every meal. Aim to fill half your plate with vegetables at lunch and dinner. Greens like broccoli and spinach, as well as carrots, are loaded with fiber. Plus, they're low in calories, meaning it's easier to bulk out your meals without overdoing it on the calories. And number three is to reach for high fiber snacks. So I know it's a little bit boring, but instead of chips or sweets, go for apples, berries, or nuts. Because the cool thing about these snacks is that they're not just high in fiber, but they're also incredibly nutrient dense. If you aim for about 30 grams of fiber, a day, you'll start to see and feel the amazing benefits to your energy, your appetite, and your digestion. It's a small shift, but it will have a huge impact. And then the last thing that we want to do to make this whole process a heck of a lot easier is to really dial in and focus on your sleep. Sleep is one of the most high leverage activities that you can focus on because of all the amazing downstream benefits that come from it. Not just for your physical health though, but for your mental health too. You're gonna have more energy, clarity, focus, strength, happiness, but probably most important of all, more drive. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about because everything just feels so much easier when you've had a few good night's sleep, doesn't it? And when it comes to your sleep, I'd encourage you to look at it this way. The next day really starts the night before. All the things that I just mentioned, energy, drive, clarity, productivity, focus, strength, they are all determined by the decisions that you make in the evening. So to improve your sleep, we need to consider three things, the regularity, the quantity, and the quality. The regularity is pretty straightforward, so we might as well box that off right now. The science shows pretty conclusively that if you go to bed and wake up the same time or within 30 to 60 minutes every single day, not only will you sleep better, but you will be in a better mood throughout the day and all the other amazing benefits that you get from good sleep. Now, to improve the quality of your sleep, we need to focus on your sleep environment. So you want your bedroom to be as cold, dark, quiet, and well-ventilated as possible. So all I want you to do is to go on Amazon and add these three things to your shopping cart. Some kind of blackout blinds, a fan, and some earplugs. None of these things are gonna break the bank, but they are going to have a profound impact in a very positive way on the quality of your sleep. And then for the ventilation, if it's safe for you to do so, I advise you to sleep with your bedroom door open, because if you think about it, if your bedroom door is closed, you are essentially over the hours that you are asleep, 
breathing in recycled carbon dioxide rather than fresh oxygen. Now, of course, I never want to put your safety at risk. So if it is impossible, you know, close your door, lock it, whatever you need to do. What you can do in that situation, as long as you don't live in a loud city or neighborhood, is just sleep with a bedroom window slightly open. And then lastly, to focus on your sleep quantity and make sure that you're getting at least seven hours of good quality sleep each night, we need to focus on your wind down routine. The first thing to do here is to set a bedtime alarm. In essence, an alarm that tells you when it's time to start winding down. Now, the time that you set your bedtime alarm for is gonna largely depend on when you wanna wake up in the morning. So let's say, for example, you wanna be waking up at 7 a.m. You wanna be going to sleep, not getting into bed, but going to sleep at the absolute latest by 11 p.m. to get that eight hours of sleep. The latest I would set your bedtime alarm in that instance is for 10 p.m. And I'd also recommend that you follow something called the three, two, one rule. This is very straightforward, but it has been game changing for so many of my clients. It's where you stop eating three hours before you go to bed, where you stop drinking anything two hours before bed. And when you come off your screens, whether it's TVs, laptops, or phones, an hour before bed. And this is important because to get into a deep sleep, our heart rate has to be at a resting level. Well, eating is a metabolic process and any metabolic process is a process that raises your heart level because it requires energy, it requires vital organs to digest and break down that food. Drinking, whether it's water, coffee, tea, alcohol, soda, whatever it might be, is gonna fill your bladder. And if your bladder is full, you're far more likely to have disturbed sleep because you have to wake up in the night to go to the loo. And of course, we all know that the screens that we spend our evenings on emit a lot of blue light. Now that blue light, the reason that's so damaging is it prevents the production of your sleep hormone called melatonin. Step number five, you probably guessed it, is to get yourself into the gym. But you really don't need to overcomplicate this. In fact, I think one of the main reasons that holds people back from actually achieving their fitness goals is think that they have to get into the gym seven days a week and train two hours every single day. But nothing could be further from the truth. To get the best results and maximize your fat loss, we want to make your workouts as efficient and as effective as possible. We want you burning the most calories, but that doesn't mean doing crazy hit sessions every single day. All you need to do is get yourself into the gym for 45 minutes, three times per week. And if you do that, and you focus on a couple of key things that I'm gonna talk you through now, you're gonna get amazing results. Now, the first thing that you wanna be doing is focusing on what we call compound movements. These are the exercises that work multiple joints and the biggest muscles in your body. So think of things like squats, deadlifts, lunges, hip thrusts, overhead press, bent over rows, cable rows, or anything like that. As I said, these exercises use the biggest muscles in your body. And that's very important because when you use the biggest muscles in your body, you burn the most calories. And the reason for that is because the bigger the muscle, the harder your body has to work, the harder your lungs have to work to breathe in the fresh oxygen. And then the harder that your heart has to work to pump that oxygen in the blood to the muscles that are required to contract. The second point is to work smarter and not harder. Like I said, most people, including junior personal trainers, will make the mistake of thinking that you need to be training six or seven days a week and doing two hour sessions. But if you can do just three 45 minute sessions, focusing on those compound moves that you just spoke about and reducing the amount of exercise variety in your sessions, you will see amazing results. Think about it. What most people do, and I understand why they do it, is they think they have to do 10 exercises every single workout. But if you think about the amount of time that you spend moving machine to machine, loading and unloading weights, that's probably like 20 minutes. Then when you add on top of that, the amount of time that most people spend on their phones when they should be working out, you realize how inefficient your current workout scheme actually is. So if you put your phone away and you reduce the amount of exercise variety, you can increase the efficiency of your workouts. You can then double down on that by instead of doing just three sets of 10, like basically everybody does, do four sets of 15 to 20 reps per exercise. So now you're gonna do more reps, which means you're gonna lift more weight, which means you're gonna do more volume, which means you're gonna burn more calories, and you're gonna do it in less time. But I think the most important principle that you can follow in the gym is to do the opposite of basically everybody else. Because let's be real, 95% of people in your gym do not have a clue what they are doing. They aren't training hard enough, 
they're not following a program, and they don't know how to lift weight with correct form. Step six, the last piece of the puzzle, is to lock in. If you really want to lose 10 pounds in the next eight weeks, you need to have a little bit of a word with yourself before you get started. Because this is going to take some compromise. You are gonna have to sacrifice some things in your life, at least in the short term, to achieve this result. Now that certainly doesn't mean that you need to give up your favorite food or lock yourself away from your friends and family or spend every single day in the gym. And hopefully in this video, I've explained why you don't need to do any of those things. However, it would be remiss and unrealistic of me to tell you that you're not gonna have to sacrifice some things in order to achieve this result. Because at the end of the day, if you do the same thing that you've been doing before, you're going to get the same result. And because you are here watching this video and you've been watching it for however many minutes I've been rambling on for, that tells me that you want to create change, which is amazing, but change requires change. The less sexy that it is, the more likely it's actually going to work because the real trick to all of this is to focus on doing the basics well. And the hardest part of all of this is going to be you actually starting. So don't focus on losing those 10 pounds. Don't focus on that big number. Just focus on losing the first pound. Because once you've developed the routine, the system, the protocol, whatever you wanna call it, that helps you to lose that first pound, whether that's in one week, two weeks, in half a week, you have the system, the blueprint, to be able to lose all 10. Along the way, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to have bad weeks, you're gonna have good weeks. You are going to fail probably several times. But the reason that most people don't get the result that they actually want is not because they don't know what they're doing, it's just because they quit. It's because they give up. So whilst every week might not be you winning the game, as long as you stay in the game, as long as you don't quit, you're still winning you're still gonna achieve the result. Don't worry about being perfect at the beginning. The goal is to build some momentum. Anyway, that is my full guide of how I would go about losing 10 pounds in the next eight weeks in the run up to Christmas. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been useful. Remember what I said though, the start point is to do the math. So if you haven't already, please make sure that you click the link in the description that is underneath this video. I'm not doing this for my benefit, I'm doing this for your benefit. Because if you click that link, if you use the calorie calculator, you are actually going to have your start point. You're going to know how many calories that you should be eating. And if you know that, you have a much better chance of actually being able to follow through the other steps and hit your goal. YouTube is pretty smart. So if you've watched this video and it knows what other videos you've been watching, it's gonna suggest one of my other ones which it thinks is gonna benefit you the most. So if you have enjoyed this video, I suggest you go ahead and watch this one next. Anyway, catch you soon.